kind of the future of aging. Right? Aubrey de Grey has, has the idea of the escape velocity, right? So for every year you live, lifespan extends by one year. Uh, I just wondered what your thoughts, do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I get actually asked this question a lot. And I, I think, I mean, currently I can't see any reason why not. I mean, I don't think we have the ability to do so quite yet. Uh, I mean, I like to stay optimistic, but I think the way I see it is whatever kind of mechanism or way we have in achieving longevity escape velocity would be a very like different lifestyle to what we are living right now. So I guess I would foresee <clears throat> there being a lot more data collection of like different biometrics, whether it's wearables or internal devices that can measure different levels of, I don't know, different genes being expressed or different inflammatory markers. So different biometrics to better link your, identify your health or like your biological age. And then I guess like the therapeutic strategies would also be very different to potential approaches we have at the moment. I think I don't see why it's not possible at, um, like in the future. I just think it would be a very different like quality of life. Like, I mean, it might be a better or, or for worse, but it also have a lot of like societal implications. And so I think I struggle to yeah imagine what life would be like if that, if it had happened. But yeah, being a scientist, I think, you know, the aim is to try and improve health span for as many people as possible. And whether that leads to some kind of escape velocity, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think why not aim high? Um, I just think it's also important to be aware of like the ramifications of such a such an approach. So I, I kind of see that kind of therapies in two, two parts. I mean, we have the small molecules and the NMNs and, and the things that we're, which make incremental difference. And then there's like the rejuvenation, which with the Yamanaka factors, which would make like a step change, potentially, if, if, if it could work. I mean, would you kind of agree with that dichotomy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I presented recently a, a video that kind of distinguished um, kind of like approaches to slow the aging process uh, as opposed to these rejuvenation approaches that would like reverse the aging process um so it's a really nice like figure i stole from a review article once which basically akins like aging to the flow of water being drawn down by gravity and then um current therapies potentially available at the moment are like uh, dams that block this flow due to gravity um but then rejuvenation strategies would be like water pumps that physically pump the water back up to the starting point. But the, the key thing with the rejuvenation strategies is they might push that water back up, but they don't prevent it from flowing down, down again. So you have to keep on like reiterating this process. But yeah, no, I agree. I think there are different, there are different ways of thinking about it. If you were thinking of like the rejuvenation technologies, do you, what do you think is the most promising at the moment? Yeah, so obviously with the announcement of like outsource labs and there's being other uh, startups in the space, a lot of them are trying to find like alternatives either to the Yamanaka factors that we know can cause cellular reprogramming, but trying to do so in a safe way such that you don't um, cause a cell to become cancerous. So what people, like often when I try to describe it, I'm like, okay, yeah, we use these Yamanaka factors and we reprogram a cell. But actually that's like the hopeful outcome. If you add Yamanaka factors to cells, the cells might die. <laughs> they might become senescent. Um, they might become transformed and become cancerous. Um, or as I said, they hopefully reprogram. Um, and so it's about trying to find an eff effective therapeutic modality that controls the expression either of these Yamanaka factors or something completely different that has a similar impact um, such that you get the, the, the right response. So the Yamanaka factors were 2006. I mean, it was some time ago that yeah. they ha has, but there's, we're still using the same four or three in David Sinclair's case. So has there been any kind of progress? Did you, have we found any new factors that are required or that help? Well, so yeah, one thing to point out is that the Yamanaka factors were initially found in like mouse cells, so mouse cell reprogramming. It's actually more complicated in human cells, where at least if you're trying to do it in a dish, you also need to add certain signaling molecules as well to help to promote the, the reprogramming. 
yeah so that's the first thing so there has also been a lot of progress since then um but i think the main challenges in reprogramming is the efficiency um and the fact that yeah there's multiple outcomes and um not all cells will get reprogrammed and it's about trying to to work out what does the cell need to do what does it need to upregulate or change to actually convert from one cell state to another there's also another kind of somewhat different area which is um trans differentiation so basically at the moment you can think of you have a specialized cell like a skin cell muscle cell you make it a stem cell and then you can make it go back into a different cell type or you can go from one cell type directly to another cell type and so there's a uh, different different uh, transcription factors so the yamanaka factors are transcription factors like p53 they they bind dna and they regulate the expression of other genes um and so that yeah there's only been a progress made in the fields i thought the main idea of like the yamanaka factors is you want to take it back to being a, a stem cell not necessarily because you want it to be a stem cell but because stem cells are younger right if you're just converting it from a skin cell to a liver cell won't it be an old skin cell going to an old liver cell, for example? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Maybe. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually used like the epigenetic clock to, to see what happens when you do that. Um, but basically, if you think about what's got to happen in either case, you have to reprogram the, the chromatin, the epigenetic states, because epigenetics ultimately governs what genes are being expressed in a cell. So if you were going to go from one cell type to another, you would have to somehow rearrange the structure such that you stop expressing like liver specific genes and start expressing skin genes. So whether or not that reprogram would also uh, make the cell younger, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, that's, that'd be an interesting study. I mean, maybe it has been done. I've not, not looked. So just from my very basic point of view, the, the Yamanaka factor seem it's like four of them, right? It seems like what they achieve is far too complex for just four proteins, for, for transcription factors. I mean, at, do we have any idea what's happening at the cellular level as to why, when they do work? Because it, yes, because I've heard that, that a lot of the time they don't actually work, like the, the hit rate is not very high. Do we know what they're doing, how they do it? Yeah. So what, before I forget to say it, one of the actual kind of like roadblocks to, to reprogramming is actually P53, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but basically, as I said, they're transcription factors. So they regulate the expression of many different genes. Um, and then the idea is that the genes that are then expressed then form these like kind of feedback loops where you have this like kind of like self-reinforcing network where um, it forms a, a kind of stable states whereby it promotes expression further expression of the yamanaka factors such that you just maintain in this this homeostatic states of pluripotency um the challenge is going from getting into that state there are definitely papers that have done closer analyses of this um and there's been studies that have like looked at the epigenetic age um several at different time points after adding the yamanaka factors so it takes like so many weeks to actually get the cell to reprogram. So you can take the cells at different time points and look at their gene expression or look at their epigenetic uh, marks and see what's happening at each time point. I can't, I, I mean, I haven't read those studies recently and I couldn't tell you much more than that, but there has been work that's tried to, yeah, see what happens at each of the stages. And I, I believe that's what some of the, the startup companies in the space are trying to do. They're trying to use that information to work out what needs to be changed and how can I find a more effective way of causing those changes instead of using like the Yamanaka factors. Yeah, just one, one more kind of thought question on this. So to me, it seems amazing that the cell knows how to go back to being a stem cell, right? I mean, it's not a random set of changes that happen. I mean, some, some methylation comes on, some methylation comes off and so on. And then the chromatin gets rearranged in a specific way. It's like, how does it know to rearrange it in that way? No, that's not, that's like a really interesting question. I mean, that's literally the definition of why I'm interested in biochemistry. There's like questions like that. How does the cell know what it's doing? How does it stay in that state? Like why, why does it not, once it's become a certain cell type, not just do something different? And yeah, I mean, you can think about there being like certain programs. Obviously one example is like the fact that 
we have offspring that start from fresh um, and so there is like natural rejuvenation somewhere in our biology encoded um, it's like how do you reactivate that program um, yeah and so it kind of leads on to something that I just find generally interesting which is like yeah genetic programs and also like synthetic genetic programs how you can use biology to make like circuits so this kind of bridges the gap between biology and like uh, well, synthetic biology but also like engineering and like physics like how you can create these like feedback loops and self-reinforcing loops as well I think there's biology is just endlessly fascinating and yeah I wish I had the answer to that question but I think that's also why the majority of scientists are in this field because there's so much like still to to explore.